Hi everybody, hope you had a great week. Welcome to LifePoint uh, Church's online worship service. We miss everyone and we can't wait to be worshiping together, singing, talking, and just uh, seeing each other's smiling faces. Uh, we hope you're all ready to worship like we are and we're looking forward to a great service. Glad, Glad you're, you're here. here. There's no space that his love can't reach. There's no place where we can't find peace. There's no end to amazing grace. Take me in with your arms spread wide. Take me in like an orphan child. Never let go. Never leave my side.
gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down Hi everyone, my name is Preston Wilson. I'm the director of student ministry here at LifePoint. We're glad you're with us this morning. I have just a few announcements for you. If you or anybody you know are still in need uh, during these past few months, you've gone through some things, we still have our fund available to help in any way that we can. All you need to do is go onto our uh, website, azlifepoint.com, and click on the COVID-19 tab. There's just a quick form to fill out so we know how we can serve you the best way. So go ahead and do that if you or anybody you know are in need during this time. We would love, love to be there to help. Also, don't forget that we have uh, material for your kids every Sunday. You can see the, the link here in the comments below, or you can go to the kids group on Facebook, the AZ Life Point Kids Group. Join that, and you get all the information that you need off of that as well. Uh, midweek, every Wednesday at 6 p.m., we have midweek. There's a few ways that you can watch midweek. You can go to our Instagram in our bio. There's a link, or you can watch it through LifePoint uh, Facebook as well. You can also type in in YouTube, Life Point Church Virtual Midweek, and it will pop up there as well. So there's a few ways that you can watch us on Wednesday. Please join us, be a part of Midweek. Uh, we're doing a kind of a new way where we're interviewing our students, so it's a great way to get to know each other, see yourself, see your friends on there. Uh, this next week's a big one. We have our seniors here at Life Point joining us for Virtual Midweek, so we're really excited about that. So show your support by watching that and just commenting so that we can all love on them well during this time. If you'd like to give, there's several ways you can give. You can give either through the mail or you can give online at azlifepoint.com. Just click on the give tab and you can give that way. Would you join me as we pray for our church of the week? It's Connections Vineyard Church. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for church. We are so glad and grateful that uh, through challenging times, you've still made ways for us to connect. You've still made ways for us to hear the gospel and to grow in our relationship with you, God. We are so grateful for that. God, we lift up our church of the week. We lift up Connections Vineyard Church to you, God. We thank you for the work that they're doing uh, sort of in the cent center of town, and we thank you that um, they've been faithful to the call that you've given them, God. We pray for their uh, ministry, God, to outreach to people in their community. We pray for confidence in their leadership as their leadership continues to grow, God. And we pray for those that have been affected in their area by COVID-19, God, that 
Uh, there would be healing, that there would be um, housing in place for those that need it. God, that they could come alongside their community, their church members, and love them well. God, we thank you for the work that they're doing in our city, God. We lift up our country to you. We lift up our world to you, God. We pray for those in leadership, that they would have the influence in their lives of you, God, that you would put people in place to pray over them, to uh, continue to seek your will and your direction, God. We pray for uh, all the churches around our city who are finding this time to be challenging or just creative. Some are just having a lot of fun with it, God, uh, in all the creative ways. And we pray for all of our churches, God, that they would continue to uh, grow and reach the people that need to hear your word, God. We pray for Life Point Church. God, this is your church, and we recognize that, and we give that to you, God. We thank you for the work that you've done here, that you're continuing to do. We thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us this morning. Take a seat, relax, as we hear a, a word from Pastor Ann. I'm sorry, one second. But he has a mustache. Uh, as we hear the word from Chris, Chris Warren. Good morning. Welcome to Life Point. Uh, we're excited to have you join us uh, this morning. Uh, my name is Chris Warren. Uh, many of you know me because my wife and I have been going to Life Point since the beginning. We also uh, serve with a, a national ministry called Crew uh, um, around the world. And so, uh, like many of you, we've had to make a lot of changes in this season uh, to our to our ministry and to our life. We are navigating uh, homeschooling uh, right now, which is a little bit crazy with a middle school, a seventh grader, a fifth grader, and a two year old running around. Uh, crazy in our house. And so there's a, there's a lot of people and a lot of energy in our house, but I've decided to keep myself busy with a couple other things in this season. I've decided to build an office shed because uh, what this season has revealed is that I need a private office uh, to do some of the work uh, that, that I need to be doing. And so uh, early projections are I'll probably finish the office shed in the late 2020s based on my uh, pace of work so far. And so uh, I am learning how to build something uh, for the first time ever. Uh, the other area I've been working on is my golf game. Is uh, feels like uh, it's the only thing open in town, and so I can go out there alone and practice and get a little space to myself. But what it's revealed to me is that uh, I'm a little bit lonely, and I kind of miss being with people. I miss doing stuff with people, and so. Um, Here's the thing, I wanna offer my services. I would like to go golfing with you, uh, mainly because of me. And some of my credentials are that I'm an expert social distancer. You know, all the grocery shopping I've been doing, I'm really good at triangulating for away from people. And my golf game is very conducive to uh, social distancing because I'm often hitting in the middle of the desert. I'm going to be far away from where I'm supposed to be, far away from you. But I'm going to have uh, the, my phone number on here. If you want to go golfing, text me, okay? I'm probably going to say yes because I'm looking to do something with people. So please, text me. Phone number on the screen. Um, we... Uh, we are navigating this season as a family, uh, much like you, and it is, can be challenging. But I, I did want to update you a little bit on some of our ministry. As, uh, as a church, you help support our family as missionaries from LifePoint Church. And we are very excited by uh, the work that's been happening. It has been challenging to pivot our ministry in this season. Um, but there have been some really good things. A, a few years ago, a handful of people in crew and in other organizations came together and said, we want to trust God to see a gospel movement on every campus in the U.S. And as that uh, coalition formed, we, um, we started to partner with a lot of organizations. In fact, we got close to 150 organizations partnering to be a part of this. And the first phase of this was, let's trust the Lord to prayer walk every campus in the U.S., and that starts with, with data. And we actually, different organizations started sharing their data. In fact, the data that we've collected is better than what the government has about where every college campus is in the United States. So after about a year of prayer walking and mobilizing people to go and ask the Lord for a, for a gospel movement to be on every college campus in the U.S., uh, this Thursday we accomplished the task and saw every campus prayed for now, it started with physical prayer walks, getting on campus and asking the Lord to start something. But when the uh, 
coronavirus started, we uh, had to pivot to digital ones. But you can do a virtual tour of campuses. And so we were touring campuses and praying for every single campus. There's about 5,300 campuses in the, um, in the U.S. Um, the other thing that we were able to do is, is our ministry crew has always been founded on prayer. And uh, we had a time where we called everyone around the world in our ministry uh, to a prayer time. And we actually had Louis Giglio come and share a word from the Lord. And we initiated a 40-day prayer chain. Well, on that call, we had almost 30,000 unique visitors. We had a, representatives from 170 countries on that call. And people are praying all over the world because we're in an unprecedented season, which means we need an unprecedented time to depend on the Lord here. And when we think about just campus ministry in general, as we were reaching college, high school, and faculty, we've had to pivot our ministry. And I think Crew has been uniquely positioned to continue to do great work. See, we're, we're a missionary order, right? Like we, missionaries go where the gospel is not. We go where there is no gospel community and we start something. We're used to starting something with lo- little resources and no facilities. We, in our position, we already had national Zoom accounts to prepare uh, our staff and our students to be doing discipleship uh, on, a, on a call in our, in our large group meetings. And so our ministry has continued. And, and you've got to remember that this younger generation, they're digital natives, so that they've been online their whole lives. So, so moving the ministry this way, though it's been a significant loss in a number of ways, we have continued to see uh, our ministry continue of reaching young people for Christ and mobilize them. See, the, the mission of the Lord has not stopped in this season and nor will it, because that is his promise. But the methods, the methods are changing, as you know, as you're attending church uh, in your living room right now. And we are going to continue to reach students for Christ and continue to mobilize young people for good work. I want to thank you for just investing in our fami- family uh, as part of our ministry, because we continue to want to reach young people for Christ. Um, this season is not without loss. You know, I as I kind of look at the scope of our year, there was a number of things where, where we just experienced loss. You know, I spent the better part of this year planning an event for college and young adult pastors in Southern California. And when this happened, that event had to be canceled. Uh, that, that we did that event virtually, turned out great. Uh, but still there was loss. Vanessa, she's the women's director at the church. She had been planning the first ever women's retreat for our church, and she had been planning with her team, working hard every week to pull this off, and we had to cancel that. Or Vanessa and I uh, were going to go, our whole family was going to be part of a summer mission in Lake Tahoe this summer. We love doing our summer missions with crew. We'd never been to this one before. We were excited about going and we had canceled all of our summer missions for crew, or at least all our physical summer missions. End of grammar school for Rachel. Um, there, are, there is a lot of loss for us. See, this has been a season of grieving loss, and it comes in waves. It's not like every moment we're feeling the pain of it, but as these waves come, there has been a lot of loss in this season. And for me, uh, the last couple of months, my, I have shifted in kind of how I've felt and how I've experienced this in my reactions. And, but I've, as I've continued to press into the Lord, there's been two things that have been evident in my own life, is that I'm experiencing loneliness and hopelessness. And I think you might be experiencing some loneliness and some hopelessness in this season too. Even though we're all together, and there's a lot of togetherness in my house right now, a lot of togetherness, Uh, there's still a feeling of being alone, of not being with your friends and not having some of those normal structures. So let me pray uh, for us this morning uh, as we jump in. Lord, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you that you love the church, you died for the church, and that we can still have a semblance of community even though we can't meet physically. So Jesus, would you be with us this morning? And would you meet us in our loneliness or whatever we're experiencing this morning? And would you minister to us through your word? We ask this in your name. Amen. I've been telling people that we're living in a Debbie Downer world. Now, Debbie Downer uh, 
if you have not seen it, is an SNL skit from a while ago. This will date myself just a little bit. But this is what Debbie Downer was. There was a scenario where a group of people would be at a happy place, say at a birthday party, or they'd be at uh, Disneyland, and they'd be having fun conversations. And anytime there was a break in conversation, Debbie Downer would share some horribly negative news, usually something about uh, a new disease, uh, something that's killing cats. There was all sorts of things she would share, and every time what would happen would be the camera would zoom in on her face, and the orchestra would play a sound of wah, wah. <laughs> And it was funny because, because there's always those people who just suck the wind out of the air, out of conversations. We're living in a Debbie Downer world right now. Every time we open... Uh, up our Facebook feed, we watch the news, we read the news, however you consume the news, we are seeing nothing but Debbie Downer data come to us. We're disagreeing with other people's news posts, we're commenting on news posts because we have all the time in the world to comment and disagree with people. We're living in a Debbie Downer world. And I have my own Debbie Downer tendencies, right? Because I, I tend to be a, a little bit on the pessimistic side. And if I consume too much news, it, it can kind of ruin my day to an extent. So I think, I think all this information that we have, right? Like I don't, uh, all the stimuli that we get from it, I don't think we were ever designed to consume this much information. And so, so we're reacting and reacting and reacting to this news. Now, now for you, we're all, we're all experiencing this pandemic in a number of different ways, right? Like some of you are experiencing it, like being, being at home from work and being with your family is a gift and you're really enjoying time together. Many of you are, are f- struggling because you're, you're the sole caretaker and breadwinner for the whole family. Or you're, you're taking care of people nonstop and you're getting no break, like my wife, Vanessa. Some of you have lost jobs or have been furloughed or there's a threat of furlough and you're wondering where your income will come from. Many of you are unmotivated by the work that you need to do. It's hard to transition to things digitally. You got to go to another Zoom meeting, another Zoom meeting or you're overwhelmingly focused on the news and you're obsessively reading and you're angry and you're frustrated. The list goes on and you can fill in your own circumstance. And I I think you should name your circumstances because it's important. But what comes with our circumstances comes a reality that is deeper and more of a fuller emotional experience that is being revealed. So I don't know what it is for you. Is it hopelessness? Is it depression? Is it loneliness? Is it loss of significance? Is it anger? Is it resignation? Is it fear? What we do with these feelings and experiences when our normal structures and support are gone, what are we doing with those? And I'll I'll tell you this, just looking on the bright side or looking at the positives or finding the silver linings is not going to solve that loss we are experiencing what we've got to do is hold on to the good news of Jesus. I grew up in uh, Northern California and, and growing up, there was always the threat of droughts and the reality of droughts. I, I think it was in the eighties uh, where they had PSAs about droughts all the times. And I, I remember driving by our reservoir in, ta- ta- uh, in town and when the droughts were gone, the, the lake would just go lower and lower and lower. And what you'd see was was kind of all the muck and the rock and the algae that was below the lake. Uh, now, now, what was below the lake had always been there, but a season of drought revealed in the open what was really there. Similarly, this season of drought that we're in, our safety nets are gone. What's been revealed in your life? Is it hopelessness? Is it anger? Is it frustration? Is it fear? What's under your lake? This morning, we're going to look at Habakkuk. Habakkuk is an unusual Old Testament book. There's just three short chapters, and the book is a dialogue between Habakkuk and God. More appropriately, Habakkuk is complaining to God, and the complaining is about um, Israel's punishment for its own wickedness when there's nations that are even more wicked than Israel. 
And it's a back and forth between God and Habakkuk. And the book concludes with a prayer of Habakkuk, which is, which is what the Lord has really been using in my life the last couple months. In fact, I, I bookmarked this a couple months ago, and I keep going back to it every couple days because the Lord has been using it in my life. And, and my encouragement for you would be in your Bible to mark this, uh, to highlight it, to save it, however, however you consume your Bible. But I think this prayer is very true to what we are experiencing today. So Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. It'll be on the screen here, but please read along in your Bibles if you have them. Though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herds in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Fruit is ceasing. The crops are bringing no food. The resources, their retirement, their flocks, they are no more. Does this sound like today, the threat of no food, the threat of no money, the threat of a loss of a job, will there be enough? Yet you, you and I can easily name the lack of resources in our life. What are those resources that you're missing? Verse 18 transitions to one of those yets or one of the buts in the Bible. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will take joy in the God of my salvation. See, because God is my strength and my sure footing. Do you think Habakkuk is just putting on a positive spin? That he's just saying this, you know, we're just going to gloss this over. It's all going to be all right. I, I don't think so. I think Habakkuk is standing on the truth of what he knows about God. Think about the I am statements that Andy and Preston have been taking us through the last few weeks uh, at church. Jesus says this about himself. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. Habakkuk knows that God is in control, that God is good. He knows that this world is fleeting and that there is an eternal weight of glory set before God's people. He is standing on the truth of who God says he is. Because our circumstances are changing and shifting, right? This season is a season of pressure. You're experiencing pressure in your life. And in that pressure, the, the resources are ceasing. Our heart is being revealed. What's under the lake is being revealed. You know, for me and my own experiences, I, I look back on the last couple of months, I'm kind of like looking at like, what, what is it was, was I experiencing? In the first week I was on, we were on vacation. When it all came out, we were on vacation. We were staying at home, but I was taking time off work. And so I just had all the time in the world to read. And I would, I would define it as disorientation or confusion for those first week and a half or so. And then I transitioned for a couple of weeks into a period of resignation where I sounded like the Ecclesiastes writer, everything is meaningless, everything is meaningless. Like I was unmotivated, I didn't want to do anything, I didn't want to rethink how we do ministry or work in my case. And then there was like a reluctant acceptance, like okay, this is going to be our new reality and it's going to go on for a while. Um, throughout that whole process, I've had to fight for joy. That joy doesn't come inherently to me, into my own heart, but I've had to fight for it because there is joy in the truth of who Jesus is in my life and in your life. One of the bright spots for me um, has been taking time to go through uh, a devotional. And this devotional is called Emo Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Day by Day. Emotionally Healthy Spiritually Day by Day. And the book just really walks through kind of a, a short morning and afternoon uh, devotional. You can do it just twice a day. I don't do it twice a day. Um, but it starts with solitude and silence. We're just two minutes of just solitude and silence, going to God in prayer, 
And this has been a season of prayer for me. And for me to have a simple structure like this in my life has been really helpful because everything kind of feels blown up a little bit. And for me to do this before I open up the news, before I know what's going on, is an act of faith for me. But it helps me orient my heart in the right way to prepare for what God has before me in the day and what I'm going to read in the news. And what I'm reminded here is, is of Second Chronicles 7, 14, and 15, right? The Lord here in, in Second Chronicles is, is um, speaking to Solomon. He's set up the temple. This is a long-time promise that God's people would have their place of worship, and they'd meet God, and he's built them. And, and uh, God is setting up a covenant between him, Solomon, and the people. But the, the words of this ring true today. So Second Chronicles seven fourteen and 15 should be on the screen. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. God listens to those who humble themselves, pray and seek his face, and turn from their wicked ways. God listens to those who humble, pray, and seek and turn from their wicked ways. And the call to, to, to prayer is critical in this season. Why? Because we have always been called to depend on him. Many of us in this church are capable people in the world's eyes, very capable. Yet dependence and surrender have always been part of God's plan upon us. We are sinfully self-sufficient we were never created to be lone rangers. And this can be a hard pill to sol swallow for people who are successful in their fields. The key is to, to take joy and turn to him and seek Jesus. It is in him we have life. It is in him we move and have our being. It is in him where the curse of the world is solved on the cross. And it is him who gives us resurrection power in every believer. It is him where we can take joy, find hope, and never be alone starting now. Because we believe the truth about who he says he is. Our emotions and our circumstances and our experiences constantly change, but he does not. He is our sure footing. Therefore, we can seek his face and trust in his character. One of the areas that has kind of been most jarring to me is how much my identity is wrapped up in what I accomplish. Like many of you, I, I find meaning and purpose in my work, and the focus of my work has completely changed. And I'm, and I'm needing to help more at home, and I'm, needing, I'm not traveling as much, and, and everything is shifting around me, and the insecurity rises in me. Am I doing enough? Am I doing enough? Am I doing enough? Because productivity can be like a drug sometimes. And I came across this quote in that devotional I spoke of earlier that I wanted to share with you. It's a, it's a bit longer. We'll put it on the screen here, but, but I found that this is significant for those of us who find significance in our work. It's from Eugene Peterson. I am busy because I am vain. I want to appear important significant. What better way than to be busy? The incredible hours, the crowded schedule, and the heavy demands of my time are proof to myself and to all who will notice that I am important. If I go to the doctor's office and there's no one waiting, and I see through a half-open door the doctor reading a book, I wonder if he's any good. Such experiences affect me. I live in a soci society in which crowded schedules and harassed conditions are evidences of importance. So I develop a crowded schedule and harass conditions. And when others notice, they acknowledge my significance and my vanity is fed. I am busy because I am lazy. I indolently let others decide what I will do instead of resolutely deciding myself. It was a favorite theme of C.S. Lewis that only lazy people work hard. By lazily abdicating the essential work of deciding and directing establishing values and setting goals, other people do it for us. My significance in this season has been shaken. Has yours? A 
Was your pre-COVID life so busy with crowded schedule and harassed conditions that you were kind of just justifying your existence that way? But now that what's under the lake has been revealed in this season, are you feeling alone? Are you feeling purposeless? Are you feeling hopeless? Those feelings are valid if that's what you're experiencing right now. But we don't have to stay there in that place. We can move towards hope as an action rooted in faith in Jesus. The pattern of processing our experience amidst changing circumstances, especially grim ones like today, is the path toward maturity. The pattern of processing our experiences amidst changing circumstances is the path toward maturity. There isn't always a straight line from grief to expectant hope. It's not a direct line from there to there. Okay, it's up and it's down and it's all over the place. But there is a constant in that journey. And that constant is the love Jesus Christ has for you. He can and will meet us in every experience, circumstance, and feeling. I know now I've had to hold on to this truth even tighter in this season because I've had that feeling of worthlessness creeping up inside me. God loves me. I am a child of God. He is life. At the end um, at the end in Matthew 28, when Jesus promised the gift of the Holy Spirit and he gave the mission of the church to make disciples of all nations, he finished with a key statement there, which was, I am with you until the end of the age. I'm with you till the end of the age. That promise and the truth of the gospel has always been what has brought me back to Jesus. He will never leave me. I am with you till the end of the age. God loves us and wants us to find our joy in him even when our experiences are hard, even when we're feeling hopeless, even when we look at the world and it looks dire. If you have never experienced the love of Jesus in your life, you can do so today. Following Christ begins by trusting him at his word. A simple prayer like, Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I have lived in my own power trying to find my own significance. Lord, will you forgive me? I know based on your word, you will forgive me and save me from my sin. If you've never prayed something like that, I want to invite you to pray. You don't have to say anything special. You can invite God in, in the spirit of those words into your life. You, you probably won't feel any sort of emotional experience. You might, or where Jesus is saving you, or you might not. And that's okay, because we stand on the truth of his word, and we believe in him. For those of you who know Christ and are walking with him, and you are feeling the weight of hopelessness and loneliness in this season, and dealing with grief, I want to encourage you that your feelings are real, and the hope of Jesus Christ is the only place and the only person where we can find hope. And my encouragement for you today is to take joy and rejoice in the Lord by seeking his face. Let me pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you can help name a reality that we are facing unprecedented challenges in this season and that it is difficult, and it is hard, and you are revealing stuff uh, that is in our lake that has been underneath for a while. I pray that you help us to not fear what's under the lake, but to be able to confess it to you, turn it over to you, so that you can turn our hearts more towards you. I pray, Lord, that you would cover us in your love today, whether it's the first time uh, knowing you, or whether we need a reminder in the truth of the gospel, Jesus. I pray that you'd be with us. I pray, Lord, in this in your name. Amen. God sends his son. They call him Jesus. 
He came to love, heal and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives no fear is gone because I know he holds the future Life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross that river and I'll find life's fine. No gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I know he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he Thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning at Life Point Church. I just wanted to take a, a couple of minutes before we wrap up this morning to just talk about the obvious. As you know by now, um, you're probably aware that we're in phase one of opening up America again. You can probably tell because I got my hair cut. The beard may come, up, come off later this week, but I got my hair cut. I actually went out to eat with my family. We sat on the patio and there was something amazing about eating a warm meal that didn't have to like get transported from a restaurant, but it just came right to our plate. We were, we were quite blessed, the things that we used to take for granted. But uh, with that in mind, many of you are probably wondering, well, when is LifePoint Church going to reopen? Well, last Wednesday, our board met via Zoom uh, to go over the feedback that you sent us. Uh, we also discussed our plan for reopening, and we hope to share that with you in the next week or so. Um, in fact, you will have something coming in the mail this week, a little mystery, and when you get it, it's going to be an even bigger mystery, wondering what does this have to do with the reopening of LifePoint Church, but uh, keep an eye out for something coming in your mail this week. Until then, um, Governor Ducey, he, he gave us this week a guidance for places of worship. Um, th the thing that you need to know, first of all, is that we were never required to shut down as a church. In fact, that is stated on the very first line of the guidance for places of worship from Arizona. It says, while ex the executive order... Uh, 2020 18 and 2020 33 did not require places of worship to stop holding services. 
they did require that such activities be conducted in a manner that provides appropriate physical distancing to the extent feasible. So the choice that we had to stop meeting was, that was our choice. We made the choice to stop meeting because we felt that that was the wise and respectable thing to do. And as we move forward, that's what we're continuing to consider. What is the wise and respectable thing to do? So we've been given what what I'm I'm calling a flashing yellow light. You know, you come to the traffic light and, and what does that mean? It means to proceed, but proceed with caution, right? You need to look left. You need to look right. So it's not really just go, get, just get in your car and go. It's, you know, as a church, we need to slow down. We need to look left. We need to look right. We need to take some time to observe, to find out when is the right time, the wise time for us to proceed as a church. So it's a proceed with caution. And, and that's exactly what our ultimate plan is. But Consider this, we're we're not just sitting around doing nothing. We're preparing for you guys to return to this facility when that time comes. Uh, Right here, I actually have a hand sanitizer station. We have multiples of these that'll be on stands and available for Sunday. And uh, we, as a board, we took time this week and we went over the survey that you all filled out. Thank you. We had a a bunch of people of you share your thoughts about reopening the church. And and we want to let you know that we heard you. We're listening. Uh, Those thoughts matter. And so we're working on to provide those things which you need to feel safe and comfortable to return to church. So I just want to let you know that we're working in that direction. We've been given the yellow light to move forward. And so God willing, we're going to move forward as quickly as we can but we want to be cautious. We want to be wise. We want to look left. We want to look right before we simply jump into things. So give us a little bit of time. We're working out a plan. Check your mail this week. uh, And then hopefully next week, we'll be able to share more about opening up LifePoint again and being together again. Well, I hope that you have a wonderful week. I hope that you stay safe. I hope that those of you who haven't had haircuts get a chance to get one. Uh, We will see you next week, same time, same place. Love you guys.